You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Look, you're going to have a lot more battery capacity, a lot more EV capacity coming on stream just in the next couple of years. And so, so you know, you've got government policy and you've got technology pushing these costs down. And so, again, I think that's just the longer term uh, narrative that is still in place despite what has happened to the global economy in the next and the last sort of four months with COVID. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. Thank you for tuning in again today. We're going to be focusing on the energy and battery metals sector today with analyst Chris Berry. You can find more information about Chris on Twitter. Follow him at C Barry one Barry spelled B-E-R-R-Y, or go to his website, discoveryinvesting.com. Com. Chris, welcome back onto the show, and I'd like to get your thoughts and insights uh, regarding what's behind a recent tweet. On July 13th, you tweeted that every single one of the names on my EV battery metal infrastructure watch list is green today. Don't think that has ever happened. Uh, what do you mean when you say that? Well, it was it was rare and unprecedented. By the way, thank you for having me on again. I appreciate the opportunity. But, uh, you know, look, I, I have a watch list of, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 names. And some of them are mining plays, uh, you know, lithium, cobalt, a lot of the, the regular um, candidates I think we all know and love. But I also look at battery plays. I look at cathode plays and even some, you know, oil and gas companies. So it's really more of an energy watch list um, and an energy infrastructure watch list. And for whatever reason, yesterday, you know, everything was green. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the amount of liquidity sloshing around in the equity markets overall. I mean, obviously, you know, yesterday, Tesla uh, exploded to, I think, about a $350 billion market cap uh, by about noon. Um, and to put that in perspective, I mean, that is larger, that $350 billion is is larger than about the next five or six uh, automotive manufacturers combined. So, you know, I think there's, um, you, you want to be really careful when you see things like that, because I think there is sort of hype and froth in the market. But also, I think it's a realization that, you know, when you look at what governments globally are doing in terms of getting behind this concept of a green new deal and green infrastructure, there is political will and there is now obviously a lot of capital behind these ideas. And so, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, despite a lot of the, the doom and gloom that we've seen in the battery metal space over the last, say, year, year and a half, there's really, I think, defensible reasons to be optimistic going forward uh, over the course of this next, say, three to five to seven years. Chris, in our last conversation earlier this year, we talked about Tesla. And one of the things we focused on in that conversation was how uh, it's almost like Tesla was driving the lithium price. I just pulled up the one year chart of Tesla and it's up six and a half times in one year. I mean, is there any more commentary or insight that you can give us on this, or is this one big fat bubble? I think, I think you know, it's it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I mean, obviously, again, for a company uh, like Tesla, that's clearly the market leader uh, in terms of EV sales and EV growth. I mean, only probably to be challenged by some of the Chinese players like BYD, for example. Um, you know, they are deserving of a premium valuation in that space. Again, I think the challenge is when you look at the product or the products that Tesla uh, produces, you get sort of a sense of the future and, and get a really sort of optimistic view and maybe can justify a, a certain valuation. But then you look at the, you know, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement and it becomes much more problematic. So, you know, uh, Tesla is years ahead of, I think, most of its uh, automotive peers with respect to uh, sustainable transportation, but of course, just battery technology as well. And so, you know, one of the other things that Tesla has announced, I think on September 22nd, is their battery day, which uh, I'm really looking forward to because I think um, they're going to come out with some really, really interesting ideas around, you know, the, the million mile battery, for example. That's something we're hearing a lot more about these days. I'm not sure if that's necessary, to be honest with you, because you're getting to a point now where, a million mile battery would outlast the car. And I'm not sure how, how you know, useful that is uh, at the end of the day. But again, you know, with respect to the batteries, you've got to bring the cost down uh, if you want to make EVs a reality. Um, and that is obviously continuing to happen. But, you know, nevertheless, um, 
uh, coming back to your original point around Tesla and the valuation, look, it's it's ser- it is obviously overvalued, and there's a lot of volatility out there. But um, they really are, you know, let's just say the Western market leader on the in the EV space, and because of that, I think they are sort of deserving of a of a premium valuation. Although I'm not sure where it stands today is that exact valuation. How has this over the last four months, uh, the COVID crisis? How has that affected? Uh, the trend in EV adoption? Well, look, it brought, I mean, uh, EV adoption, and you, you could sort of lump that into what's happened with the global economy. I mean, COVID has, you know, brought everything sort of in March and April to a uh, screeching halt from a production perspective. And so, and obviously the automotive business was not immune to that. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at what has happened to the EV space, so let's just say the broader battery metal space over the last, not just four months, but last year, you know, you have the U.S.-China trade war, which I think is going to continue unabated, despite, um, you know, who wins the presidential election here in the United States in November. Um, That really threw sand in the gears of the global trading system. Um, And then COVID um, was was the, I don't know, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of different ways that we can can think about this. Um, I do think that, you know, once we get through the worst effects of the pandemic, um, look, you're going to have a lot more battery capacity, a lot more EV capacity coming on stream just in the next couple of years. And so that capacity, I think, is one of the things coupled with government policy, whether or not it's here in the United States or obviously EU and the Green Deal, new Green Deal that they are are proposing, or or other countries as well. For example, South Korea came out this morning and talked about spending, I think it was $95 billion on their own green, um, new Green Deal. So, you know, you've got government policy and you've got technology pushing these costs down. And so, again, I think that's just the longer term uh, narrative that is still in place despite what has happened to the global economy in the next and the last sort of four months with COVID. On the Democrat side of the aisle here in the States, there's talk of having the U.S. economy completely oil free and only green by the year 2035. Uh, what are your thoughts on this proposal? Yeah, look, I think it's it's hopeful, but I think it's nonsense. Um, look, even during the worst sort of uh, at the worst point in time here for in the United States, when COVID was, I think, really sinking its teeth into the economy and we had shut almost everything down, you know, the global economy in particular still used 70 million barrels a day of oil. Okay, and this is a global economy that, um, again, was roughly at a standstill for a period of time. So, you know, look, I'm hopeful that over the next 15 years, we can perhaps minimize fossil fuels, whether or not it's in transportation or some of the other sectors. But I would be a little bit skeptical uh, to think that, you know, we're at we're at sort of zero uh, fossil fuel use in the next 15 years. I just think that uh, it's too intertwined in too many aspects of the global economy. Do you think that the economy will ever 100 percent move away from oil? Sure. I mean, the question is, you know, what's the probability of that happening and what's the timing? Um, again, I just think that, you know, we, when we think about oil, we think about transportation, whether or not it's aviation or automotive or what have you. But oil is used in dozens upon dozens upon dozens of everyday products, you know, plastics, so on and so forth. And so, you know, getting away or not using any oil uh, to power the global economy. I mean, I, I would be more hopeful or possibly more optimistic that over the next, you know, 20 to 30 to perhaps 50 years, we could do that in transportation, uh, again, fueled by batteries. Uh, but I wouldn't think that the global economy would ever, you know, release its uh, or, you know, its addiction to uh, fossil fuels. What about the green power generation, wind and solar? A lot of times um, you mentioned unrealistic, uh, the plan to be completely oil free by 2035. When I see some plans for you know, sustainable wind and solar, I just say to myself, that doesn't seem uh, economic at all. In in some ways, it doesn't even seem environmental uh, make, making sense. Uh, what are your thoughts on how wind and solar factor in to a more sustainable future? Yeah, look, I think the good news is that when you look at, for example, solar um, power pricing, um, it is continuing to fall and it's continuing to crash, uh, which, is, which is the good kind of cost deflation that I think you want to see. Um, look, a, a lot of these green technologies or green energies are energy intensive, right? I mean, think about, 
you know, how much uh, you need with respect, how many, how many literally tons of rare earths you would need for a single large wind turbine. Um, and that's something that I think, you know, the, the green lobby, if you will, has started to wake up to. It's that there's no free lunch. Uh, if we do want to build a more sustainable economy um, with respect to how energy is generated and stored and utilized, it's going to take a lot more with respect to raw materials. So, you know, I do think you want to be looking at, um, for example, you know, just to talk about how we get there. I mean, obviously there are mining technologies on the lithium side, for example, that uh, use less water, uh, use lower evaporation ponds, if any evaporation ponds at all, and they look like they are going to be cost competitive uh, going forward. I'm of course referring to direct lithium extraction technology. So, you know, I guess my view to, to bring it back to your original question, you know, how do we get there? How do we get to a more sustainable economy powered by wind and solar and backed up by batteries? It's going to take um, a leveraging of some of these next generation technologies, again, around lithium extraction, around um, some other of these different types of technologies to really get us there and lower the overall costs. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of high-grade copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% internal rate of return. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades in New York and Toronto under the ticker TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. Uh, many proponents of nuclear energy point out that the wind always doesn't blow and the sun always doesn't shine. Therefore, the most secure and consistent baseload uh, generation is nuclear. So would you agree with those that say we do not have wide scale electrical vehicle adoption unless we have nuclear? It depends on battery technology, you know, really more than anything else. I mean, there are pros and cons to every source of energy. Uh, nuclear is, is no saint. Uh, when you look at cost blowouts and so on and so forth, I'm you know pretty neutral on the subject to be honest with you. I do think that um, yes, it's undeniable that nuclear is is scalable and carbon free and so on and so forth. But um, you know it's it's going to be a, I think a, a smaller part of the overall mix going forward. Probably not gain market share the same way that wind and solar are going to because they are lower cost and quite frankly. Uh, you know, more scalable depending upon how you look at things. If we move towards the adoption of EVs more and more, that of course will get rid of the internal combustion engines, which also have catalytic converters. So the air quality out, out the exhaust is better. Do you, with that in mind, do you have any forecast or thoughts on palladium as a commodity and where the price of palladium might go? You know, I, I don't have any specific casts on palladium per, per se. I, I would want to point out that you know, we're all excited about electric vehicles and we can, you know, if you're a believer, you can see this happening, whether or not it's in fleets or, you know, just light duty vehicles. But, you know, even if you get to a situation, say by, you know, 2028, so eight years from now, and you've got 10% or 12% electric vehicle penetration globally, you still got 88% internal combustion engine penetration. So, you know, it does presumably put a dent in palladium demand, but by no means does this mean that palladium is going to crash through the floor because a major end use in catalytic converters is not there anymore. Um, so, you know, I, that is one of the other things I think you want to keep in mind as you're trying to balance, well, you know, what's going to happen with palladium or silver or lithium or any of these metals used in transportation. Um, as the automotive business grows sort of overall, you know, I think it stands to reason that outside of recycling technologies, um, there's still a, a very viable future for palladium demand across the automotive sector. I'd like to get your thoughts on copper. Copper is now closing in on that $3 a pound again after it sold down to about two ten a pound in the mid-March uh, sell-off. What do you think is behind this rise in the copper price? I think it's, it's you know, Fed-induced liquidity in the markets. I think it's, um, you know, to varying degrees, economies coming back online. 
I think it's um, ch production challenges in countries like Chile. I think you know, with a little bit of a supply pinch, um, and I think it's it's speculation. Um, I'm not convinced that you know copper deserves to be trading at 290 a pound today, uh, just solely based on global demand. Uh, when you sort of look at some of the largest economies in the world, whether or not it's China or the United States, and you look at unemployment, you look at spending, you look at industrial production, uh, the data looks a little bit iffy. And if we assume, as many people do, that copper is, you know, a, it's got its PhD in economics or whatever people say, um, I'm happy that it's where it is, you know, at 290 a pound. But I think I don't think it's demand driven. I think that there are a number of different forces here, and I'm just not sure, quite frankly, how sustainable they are to keep uh, copper at, at the current levels that it's at right now. With the trend of electrification, we of course need copper, and EVs, I believe, use five times or more. The copper, I don't remember exactly, but it's something like that. So with those things in mind, are you long-term though, mul over multi-years, would you be considered a copper bull? Absolutely. And and to go back to your original question, it's, again, it depends on you know what you're what you're looking at from an automotive perspective, but for light duty vehicles, you need about three times as much copper in an EV as you do in a traditional internal combustion engine. Um, so you know, again, you get into the you get to a point where okay, well, what does it take to bring a new copper mine on stream? I mean, you know, a lot of people in the lithium, lithium world get upset or get nervous when you're talking about oh, we need half a billion dollars for you know 25,000 tons of lithium carbonate. I mean, a new copper mine. Will, will run you into the billions of dollars, okay? And that, of course, takes time and you have to work out the kinks and so on and so forth. So, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable long-term with $3 copper. Um, obviously, you know, what has happened to the global economy, the, the acts this pandemic are still being... Again, I think when you think about um, all the testing around green infrastructure, you know, right at the right at the center of your, um, um, I guess, target in terms of metals that you really like in that respect. Chris, before we conclude, can you give us some of the key points that we should know about lithium and the lithium supply chain right now on the other side of the outbreak of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, I think that, you know, look, I mean, the lithium price uh, did nothing for a number of years up until about 2016. And then it was a mixture of Chinese investment and Tesla and this belief that, you know, batteries were going to get cheaper faster. And that took lithium pricing from lithium carbonate pricing from say $6,500 a ton to about $20,000 a ton uh, in 2018. And today we're back sort of, we've done basically a, a round tripper where we're back around $6,500 a ton. Again, that's a very rough number. Uh, one of the challenges with lithium, of course, is that there's no single price. But, you know, I think some of the, the major issues with lithium right now, the industry is dealing with oversupply. Uh, by my numbers, there are around, uh, is around, I should say, six months of what would be termed LCE, lithium carbonate equivalent supply, swimming around in the market. Um, and that is being compounded by the fact that existing producers are continuing to add supply to the market. So, you know, we, we have to chew through uh, the excess supply that is out there in the market right now before we can get to a point where, okay, the market equilibrates and we're going to start a new bull run. Uh, I guess my own view is that I would not expect to see structurally higher or trending higher lithium pricing before 2022, Okay. Uh, the good news is, and again, as I mentioned this before, whether or not it's here in the United States, China, South Korea, almost any number of countries, of course, the European Union, um, these governments are fully behind this green growth narrative. Uh, and that is, I think, bolstered by ESG mandates that companies are going to have to you know, follow, follow through on. So look, I mean, it's going to be, I think, a quiet in some respects. Um, you know, year in 2021, but I'm I'm quite optimistic, in particular on lithium from say 2022 going forward. Chris's website again is discoveryinvesting.com, and I'll also put a link in the show notes to Chris's Twitter feed if you want to follow him there and see what he's thinking on a day to day and week to week basis. Chris, I really appreciate you coming on today's show and providing an update regarding the battery sector. Enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.